Snuff was a form back in the olden days, probably still exists, don't know if anybody still uses it, a powdered form of tobacco that was snuffed into the nasal cavity to get a hit of tobacco through the loads and loads of blood vessels inside the nasal cavity that we'll probably talk about one day, little there, little there and what have you. Anyway, on the back of the hand, that's where you place your snuff. You could do it between finger and thumb, um, and you could do it between on this little bit of skin here, but this patch here, when you pull your thumb away from your finger, you create the anatomical snuff box, a handy place to put your snuff and snort it from. But clinically, there is some very useful anatomy here. So while it's a very small part of the back of your hand, of course, you'd love to know the back of your hand better, right? Um, we're going to look at the tendons that form the anatomical snuff box and describe what we can find here. There are bones, um, there's an artery, there's a nerve, there's a vein, all in this little spot. The most difficult bit for me when we're looking at the anatomical snuff box is remembering what these tendons are and which is which. There's actually three here. There are two that are obvious, but there's actually a pair of tendons here. So first of all, we need to consider the movements of the thumb. If we think about the fingers, that's flexion of the fingers and extension of the fingers, and that is abduction and adduction, right? The thumb has the same movements, but the thumb is considered to be on a plane at 90 degrees to the fingers, which means that flexion of the thumb is that. Extension of the thumb is that. Um, so abduction is this, right? So that's abduction, that's abduction. So then to bring the thumb back, that's adduction. So abduction, adduction, right? Now, given that, what movement are we doing to make these tendons appear here? Ah, oh, well that's, that's extension of the thumb, isn't it? Extension, so I said, I said that was flexion and that's extension. So when we extend the thumb, we see these tendons. Well, there you go then. This must be, okay, the name for the thumb, the thumb, the name for the thumb is the pollex. So the muscles that move the thumb are pollicis, or often called pollicis muscles. I say pollicis. I was taught by a man that said microscope. Um, hard C's, it's, anyway. So be mindful <laughs> of what I say um, and regional dialects and stuff. Anyway, so we're extending the thumb, we're extending the pollex, so these must be extensor pollicis muscles or tendons of extensor pollicis muscles. And if there are two of them, uh, one's probably short, one's probably long. So there's, there's a short muscle and a long muscle. So one of these is, is, is extensor pollicis brevis and one of these is extensor pollicis longus. Now, which is which? Well, this tendon Okay, so this tendon is running down here, so we can palpate the muscle. Huh. But it doesn't seem to go very far. It hasn't got really very far to go to. So this must be the tendon of extensor pollicis brevis, the short one. Whereas this tendon, this is running to the forearm. Ah, oh, this has got loads of room to go into. This then is going to be the tendon of extensor pollicis longus. This is the really long extensor muscle of the, of the thumb. Now, I said there's two tendons. There's actually two tendons here. So the other movement, so if that's extension of the thumb, I'm moving there from extension to abduction. And I can feel, you can feel this yourself as well here, right? That's oh, really cool. <laughs> it's really cool. You can feel this tendon here. Then as you move to abduct the thumb, you can just about feel there's another tendon here up against it that's helping move the thumb around or keep it, or pull it abducted. So the tendon here must be an abductor of the thumb. So this other tendon here is actually the tendon of abductor pollicis longus. Don't think you can see it, but I can feel it. Abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis, and then this tendon is extensor pollicis longus. So those are the major borders 
of the anatomical snuff box. That's what puts us into this place. That's the bit I find hardest. The other bits are all right. Okay, so you found your anatomical snuff box. Right, get your thumb in there. Mm, have a poke around. Move your wrist around. What can you feel in there? You can feel some specific stuff, right? Let's use your right hand. You can feel, you can feel these things. So here, this is the radius, right? So radius and ulna. And look, it's the radius, the distal radius has this big articulating surface that articulates with the wrist. And it has this little pointy projection here. This is the styloid process of the radius. And look at that. That is right in mm, the anatomical snuff box. So if you put your, your finger or your thumb in the proximal part, that is the bit closest to your shoulder, the proximal part of the anatomical snuff box, and you move your wrist around, you can feel so the, rad the styloid process of the radius stays in place, but you kind of get, everything else moves around, everything gets pulled around. So this means if, you're, um, if somebody has a suspected distal fracture of the radius, you know where the styloid process should be, gives you a marker, right? Okay, Ooh, nice. Now, mm, you can feel, if you go a little bit more distal, that is towards the thumb inside the anatomical snuff box, you can feel another good lump in there. But when you move your wrist, it moves, it moves away. It's, it's, it's moving. Huh, what's that then? Well, that's gonna be one of the carpal bones. And actually you can feel how your carpal bones move if you palpate these things and move your wrist around. This is the, right? Look at the back of the hand here. These are all the carpal bones, the carpus. These are the bones of the wrist. There are eight. And here's the thumb, the, bo the bone at the base of the thumb is trapezium. And then the bone, this large bone here, between the trapezium and the radius is the scaphoid bone. So those are in the floor of the anatomical snuff box. Those are the other bones that you can feel moving around in there. So the scaphoid bone is the bone that's closest to the radius. Um, and that's why this is, I don't know, there are a couple of reasons why this anatomy is so useful clinically, but one of them is if somebody has fallen on an outstretched hand and the force gets pushed from the wrist through the scaphoid bone into the radius, do you see? Um, which means that if you suspect a scaphoid fracture on x-ray, it can be very difficult to see that it is fractured. But if you find the anatomical snuff box and push in the anatomical snuff box, you're pushing on the scaphoid bone. It's likely that if it's being fractured, the person will feel pain when you push on the fractured bone. So it's a really good clinical indicator of a fractured scaphoid bone. Um, it, this is a really important bone to look after. Even with multiple x-rays from different angles, you might even leave it a week and you might see some changes there. It can still be a really difficult fracture to detect. Um, if you use CT or MR, it's much easier, but those are less common. Um, and if it's fractured and isn't splinted and you know, put in a cast and allowed to heal properly, then a non-union of this bone can it can cause some real problems in the wrist. It'll cause, you know, degeneration of the bone, probably osteoarthritis and what have you later on in life. So it's really important to be able to identify a scaphoid fracture, but it's quite difficult to do so and then manage it appropriately. Okay, so scaphoid and trapezium. That's the floor of the anatomical snuff box. If I grab a muscular model, of the region with, oh look, good job I was using the right hand, it's the same hand. Actually, we can see the tendons here. These are those tendons I was talking about. And we can see some other things. We can see a blood vessel in there. There's an artery in the floor of the anatomical snuff box. So which artery is this? Ah, look. So this is the thumb size. This is the radial artery here, where you would palpate a pulse. 
and look, it's running around posteriorly, so the radial artery is running through the floor of the anatomical snuff box. Well, that's interesting. And then look, we've got some nerves here. Well, okay, so we've got the same deal essentially. This is the radial nerve. This is the superficial branch of the radial nerve. One of its jobs is to carry sensory innovation from this region of skin here. So the superficial branch of the radial nerve is crossing the anatomical snuff box. And you can see it's doing that quite proximally, quite, you know, down this end towards, towards the elbow as it were. So the superficial branch of the radial nerve. Ah, the other thing that's useful clinically is the, um, what do they call it? The Hausman's, the Hausman's vein. <laughs> um, something I never have to do. I have a PhD. I do anatomy and science because I like anatomy and science. I'm not a medical doctor. But my clinical colleagues um, tell me of uh, the Hausman's vein or Hausman's friend in here. Now, the veins of the upper limb, there is a... There is a cephalic vein, kind of. The veins of the upper, the veins of the upper limb are all a little bit um, variable, but um, on this side, we can find the cephalic vein is going to eventually, it's going to run up here, um, meet with the other side of the cubital fossa, and run up to the top side of the limb here. But if you're trying to get access to a vein in a patient, this is a good one to go for. Um, and the most commonly used vein is this one here, the median cubital vein, that's usually nice and easy to get hold of. But in some patients it can be difficult to get into veins and find a vein. This is the one that the houseman, which in Britain is a junior doctor, so your first doctoring jobs after leaving medical school, it's usually your job to put the needles in and, and access venous blood and that sort of thing. Uh, and this is often the one that's easier to access in here. You can get a needle into, so we haven't got it on the model, but the cephalic vein is running, oh, oh I can see mine starting to pop up here, I think. I'm very white, so it's all very reflective. Um, but the, the, the cephalic vein is running over the anatomical snuff box. So you can find the anatomical snuff box, find that, oh, there it is, there it is. Find the vein and um, put a needle in it. Houseman's friend, Houseman's vein. How's that? That's the anatomy of the anatomical snuff box. The tendons that form its walls, the bones that you can palpate in the floor, the nerve that crosses it, superficial branch of the radial nerve, the radial artery crosses it, and the Houseman's friend, the cephalic vein, crosses it as well. So it's a good, useful anatomical landmark. And of course, the, the roof is just, is just the skin. Yeah, Rob will have it. Anyway, oh, there's a lot of anatomy in the hand, so I hope that was um, hope that was useful. Right, see you next week. Oh, my hand's really sore now.